You're listening to Bedroom Beethoven's, where notable music makers break down stories accompanied by songs and melodies documenting growth through their 10,000 hour journey. And me? Well, my name is Cello, your host. I am a bedroom Beethoven. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to episode 153. My guest this week is... My name is Pat, Pat Howard. I am, uh, I think, you know, probably a drummer first, but uh, a producer, a multi-instrumentalist. I'm one-third of the band Magic City Hippies, and I work with few artists um apart from that and um i'm just a music music lover and a devoted music maker and uh you know a, a recent transplant to, to los angeles california Magic City Hippies Invade the Podcast this week, which you might think is weird because they actually just wrapped up a tour right now. They played in H-Town just last week, where I am. But that's more reason for drummer Pat Howard to come on and tell his story, give his reasons, and walk us through his 10,000-hour journey. While most of the episodes here involve rap figures, it's this exact shades-on, shirts-and-button attitude which makes Magic City Hippies generate the kind of heat they could have powered a high-seas yacht party in the 70s. And Pat is so cool that if he stepped off the screen from some long-lost Quentin Tarantino flick in slow motion, I wouldn't question it. So strap in, and let's have a great conversation that kicks off this month of March. But before we get to it all, please support the show, keep it ad-free, and make me feel good inside the hat trick of giving. By visiting patreon.com slash bedroom Beethoven's, my patrons mean so much to me. They really do, and I give them access to early episodes and shout-outs, and it's a really great community. You should consider joining if you like what I do. Also, BedroomBeethovens.com is the website. You can check out past episodes and poke around there. Lastly, this podcast is available wherever you get podcasts. Spotify, Apple, Podcasts, Pandora, Stitcher, Google, everywhere but Kanye's STEM player. Appreciate everyone for tuning in, and I am just glad to be the conduit between fan and musician. They get exposure, and you get to learn more about the people you rock out to. Let's get this episode started. Oh, so you and Mark Ronson now live in the same city. Is he out here now? I thought yeah. he moved back. Because I saw oh, his did he? I saw his architectural digest, right? He had his like spot in Los Feliz. Um and and then I was like, I don't know, it seemed like it seemed like he moved back to New York in the pandemic, but maybe maybe now it's the double it's the unexodus now. Like maybe people are kind of just back where they were. Yeah, I mean, with the high cost of living though, and everything being remote and shut down, is it even still worth it? You know, I mean, you could move back to your childhood home in Wisconsin and still what needs to be done, right? <laughs> My parents would love that, actually. <laughs> um, it's <laughs> It's true. It's true. Well, that's what my my sister's doing too. She's um, they're like they're both lawyers. Her and my brother in law, and they're just yesterday they left to Montana because they're just like we're just gonna go be lawyers, you know, remotely from Montana from Big Sky. So you can still you can still do that. Honestly, this week I think is exactly two years that I've had like an address in L.A. And it, this is kind of my I I would say two years, but it's kind of a do over a year. This is kind of like my mulligan because yeah, I literally like my lease started. I mean, I was here a month beforehand in 2020, but like my lease started on like April fool's day, 2020, <laughs> like in LA, I was like, yep, here I am. And then, you know, lockdown, shut down world, 
world ended, like people had to explain to me, like, well, it's normally like you know, like this or whatever. Normally, there's a, an event going on here. <laughs> High cost of living with none of the benefits yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the first thing that happened is someone stole my catalytic. Someone stole my catalytic converter immediately, though. That happened. I hear that happens a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <it does. laughs> uh, you mentioned your parents. Your dad's an engineer, right? My dad, yeah. Well, he's retired now, happily retired, and and they're both um, they're living up in what was like our kind of like cabin by the lake, you know, when I was a kid. And over the years, they've been adding to it, and then they made it their like retirement nest up there. And that's in it's it's actually it's called Spread Eagle, Wisconsin, believe it or not. But um, yeah, they're way up there. Um, he was he worked for Motorola. He's an electrical engineer for. 35 years he worked from like 1976 to 2009 at motorola like you know, for the same company obviously like moved up and, and everything but yeah he was an electrical engineer my mom was like a nutritionist like food scientist but but then uh, eventually like a stay-at-home mom and but also like she like was a coach like a track and cross-country coach and, and all that stuff well, so your your dad's an engineer your mom's a scientist your sisters are lawyers Okay, so so while your dad well, is, is yeah, one sister's a lawyer, one's a physical therapist. Everyone's so, everyone else is so legit. I'm the black sheep. <laughs> if your dad is directing Six Sigma processes to standardize engineering applications and solutions for Fortune 500 companies, and then his son is a musician, how supportive is he from like a parent's POV? Because now his son's a rock star and not an accountant at big pharma or whatever the academia route would have been or where it would have took you, you know, you, you traded in the briefcase for the drumstick. Yeah. Well, he, I think, I mean, God bless my parents. God bless my, I mean, I, my dad, I think, uh, he's very supportive. The answer to answer that question is very, very supportive. Um, everybody very supportive. I, I got a uh, drum set when I was six years old and that's like, that's a big decision. Like we weren't in a very big house at that point. Um, and my grandma and my mom's side lived with us. Like she was like the, probably the closest bedroom to like where the drum set was to give a six year old a drum kit. Like that's gotta be kind of a committee decision. (laughs) And they were willing to do that. So I had maybe a a knack for it. I was already like, you know, I think my aunt, my dad's older sister, my aunt Peg, like heard me playing along to like Tusk by Fleetwood Mac or something like in the back seat. It was like, Playing in time, you know, it's, it's not bad. And uh, I think she got in his ear about it. And my dad, vicariously, I mean, he's just very loves drummers. He wanted to be a drummer, so that helps. He like, you know, had to like save up on his paper route in the sixties and buy like his drum set. His dad was a hard ass about it. He had to buy his drum set like one piece at a time. Like he bought his like snare drum. Then he, he saved up enough money to get a hi hat and then like a bass drum or whatever. And he had a, a band that would like, you know, cover like the kinks and like, you know, the Kingsmen like Louie Louie and stuff like that. And I think he just realized he was also like, he realized his knack was like, he, he would order, you know, um, mail order catalogs or whatever, like the Sears catalogs or whatever, and build like the amplifiers, right? Like he, I think he like built his bass player's amplifier. Um, so it's like, oh, maybe your maybe his knack was you know for something apart from drumming when drumming wasn't like just like something that came supernaturally to him. But he always noticed drummers. Um, I mean, like the first thing you know, he showed he showed me John Bonham, like Led Zeppelin. And, you know, Steely Dan, all, all these things where he didn't, yeah, he knew a lot about John Bonham and, and other drummers, but there was just always songs where maybe he didn't even know who was playing drums, but he could always tell like, ooh, this is like, this is a good groove or like, this is a good drummer, you know, and he would always feed me, feed me stuff like that. And it's just super, had a, you know, a lot of, for someone who's not actually a drummer himself and didn't take that, um, like studying that or anything in, later into his life at all, um, was very like interested. You know, and, and very supportive. So that, that and then that's shortly cool. thereafter, you became a Buffalo Groove Teen Splash Bash legend, sir, with your world famous drum session. Oh man! Oh god! Wow! Wow! That's crazy. Yeah, the Teen Splash Bash. Yeah, that's Willow Stream. That's At Willow the Willow Stream, Stream Pool. Willow Stream Pool, which is is still there. Now it has a water slide. I think I went there. Um, I walked to that park a couple of years ago. 
Yeah, they that should have a statue the, of you in the middle. They should. You're, you're absolutely <laughs> right. You're right. No. Um. Wow, Willow Stream. Yeah, that was like the stomping grounds. That was like me and my first bandmates. So that was my band, uh, Four Foot Nothing, which we then then went Four FN with it because that's oh, like, so Four FN like DC Five, like the Dave Clark Five. Very nice, nice touch. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We we th- those are my bandmates. I used to skateboard with. I met them skateboarding in the park. Yeah, they were the public school kids. I went to the Catholic school in in my neighborhood, which is a lot smaller, and then. I met them. They were like my, we were like misfit, like skater punk friends. And then we, we just got together, started covering like Blink-182 songs. And um, I don't know like what else we said. We were also really into classic rock. So it was like a weird hodgepodge of like interests in that. But that was, those are the guys like, you know, we got where you first get the courage, you know, to like kind of get, get some tunes together and like get shows, you know, and we're like play like battle of the bands and stuff like that. Um. And yeah, the Teen Splash Bash was kind of like, you know, those, I don't know if it was the lifeguards or whatever, like, or the, the park district wanted to put together like a talent show. And I remember it was a big deal. That was like, that was the first, I was like nervous for that. Like all these girls from my school that came out in the middle of the summer, come see us play like, you know, next to the pool. It was cool. So how how does it migrate from like Steely Dan to Blink-182 to skateboarding? And then now you have an interest in hip hop because you can see that influence in Burnt and Fanfare you know, the songs from back in the day. And, and then let me just say the video for the song Fanfare is very nice because Orango Tang is as close as you're going to get to like a Hype Williams in the music video game. You guys did good with that one. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely his brand. Definitely the, <laughs> definitely the, you know, the greasy butt cheeks and stuff. Um, but he's also, you know, he's very, um, his, his brand is very, uh, it's evolved a lot, you know, over the years, and it just celebrates the female form or just anybody's, you know, form. He shoots a lot of different types of models and everything like that. And definitely, yeah, definitely like a hype Williams vibe. The vibe, you know, he took it that direction. Um, you know, it's all it's all groove and drums, and like the more the further I get along, you know, at it and try to like get out of my head working on any anything, and because um, like you know the hippie stuff is so different. I also produce for an artist named Maya, and like her biggest song is basically like um, like a bolero, and like my my reference point, at least for the production on that, was like "Girl from Ipanema," and then it's like there's this other, these other songs where we're where in the hippies we're pitching down vocals like ASAP Rocky, but then we're, you know, we got horn sections, yeah, like sound like Steely Dan and some. It, it's just kind of like anything, you know, little little pieces of references and stuff kind of come to mind. Um, but it's all just it's all just like chasing the goosebumps a little bit and like rhythm rhythm and like and pocket and like pocket has a lot of different forms it's not always like a big like you know chop the drum sample boom bap thing sometimes it's like a really soft thing. sometimes it's just a shaker sometimes it's in someone's fingers on like a boss a guitar thing so i don't know it's like i'm realizing it's all it's all kind of the sensibilities all come from the same place I mean, my, with hip hop, I think it was a little bit, it was a little bit roundabout because like I got into, I was into all these bands and, and bands with drummers and, and real musicians, right? Like I got the first two instruments I got into was drums and then it was, um, and then it was bass, guitar. And I didn't realize, like, I, I was really, like, really into Incubus, right? When I was in like sixth and seventh grade and I, I heard like the scratching on that, right? Like DJ Kilmore, whatever. At first, I think it was DJ um, 1987 or something, but eventually it was DJ Kilmore, and I was like, oh, that's sick. And they got like Cut Chemists, who I later learned from like Jurassic Five and stuff, on a track, and I just liked the sound of it. You know, I didn't really know anything of the of the legacy of it, or and and that was kind of roundabout. So I got myself, I telemarketed for summer. I remember I got myself an SL1200. And like a, ba- a Vestax like battle mixer, and I like learned to scratch, but kind of with no, like it wasn't because of DJ Premier or, or Beat Rocker. Yeah. 
and then yeah i had i had you know a couple of friends you know i started like smoking <laughs> smoking weed with some of my friends um who like really like knew their shit about old school hip hop and everything and we kind of traced it all back like and everything from you know everything from like the from Illmatic and the Pete Rock stuff and the Egypt Mir stuff to like the Rhyme Sayer stuff. I know you've had uh, you had Brother Ali on an episode before, like uh, in Illa J. Yeah. Like DJ you know, Kilmore has been on too. Really? No shit. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Episode one seventeen and Newmark came on there and he talked about uh, that Scratch Lactica track. Yeah, Battle Battlestar Scratchica. Yeah. There's a there's a if you go on a deep dive, there's a YouTube video of me scratching over that instrumental uh, somewhere in my dorm room. I love I love that song, um, but yeah, like there was just all these. Like I think I, I realized later, I was like, oh man, I'm like into all these features of this, and like I didn't even, you know, you think that you have to be in a in a band, like you have this like archetypal thing or whatever. It's like, oh, if I'm gonna try to do this, I'm got to be in a band. I got to be like Travis Barker. I got to be like whatever. And I was I loved the the sense of identity and pride that came from the concept of like the hip hop producer, especially in the, in the golden era, you know, how like they had, you know, the Pete rocks and Jay Dillas and, um, large professors. And, you know, they had, they had this, uh, clout and name recognition and like shout outs on the tracks and everything. And I was like, Oh, I could like, I could do that. Granted that like, this is like, I'm, like a white kid in like suburban Northwest suburbs of Chicago or whatever in 2000, you know, I was like 10, 15 years too late for like what I'm romanticizing. But, um, and there's just like some, sort of fascination with like some some um i don't know thinking myself into a direction of like i you know i i think i could be a producer like this could be this could be my role and hip hop i think is the first the first thing that shows you like oh i can build this whole world like i don't have to like you know and then then comes the mission for like well who's going to who's going to rap over this <laughs> like who do i know who can rap over this or what singers do i know or whatever and but that was yeah that was something i think after like my breakup with like my first with like my high school girlfriend and like going off to school i think i like spent a whole summer in my basement with like my m box and my turntable my bass and i bought like uh bought an mpc 2000 xl you know that saved on to 100 megabyte zip and um you know started making beats and at that point i was miserable because i was still i was actually studying electrical engineering <laughs> for the first year and a half of of college at University of Miami, which has an amazing music school, but I wasn't um, in it, um, which had like some, you know, I could convince my parents, like, you know, it's a lot of credits transferred over. I'd still get a minor in electrical engineering. It's like a super, it's like a bachelor's of science, blah, 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 all that stuff. But really like, you know, I just wanted to, I wanted to figure out how to make records and, and just get better at that and, and figure out how to make that, you know, what I do. Well, regarding these basement sessions, how can I hear one of these infamous beats you craft around Doom acapellas? That was that was a cool thing too. Like, I think that's super encouraging. Is like if you're doubting your beats, you know, like you got to leave room for a vocal. Like that's something that's a pitfall of production. If you're trying to make something to make room to leave room for a vocalist, you'll think your beat is boring, but it's not. It's it's got to leave room, you know, for a vocal. And and if sometimes I'd be like, oh, this isn't like that good. Like it's it's not giving me the whole, you know, the whole all the feels and then i'll just like you know yeah grab grab an mf doom you know acapella grab or nowadays i grab like a kendrick acapella and i'm like oh yeah like the beat the beat's done like if you know once you hear just something like that over it i remember i um i had a buddy named david mark who was you know tried his hand at at, at being a rapper for a little while and he had he had you know some talent for it um eventually moved on to you know to other things just a career in finance and stuff like that but um Early on, he was networking like in the Chicago scene for a while, even though I was going to school in Miami, I'd still come back for like winter break and for summer. And uh, he got to know uh, Wild Style from Crucial Conflict, um, which is, you know, like OG, you know, Chicago scene uh, mentor to a, to a lot of people who came out of, I, I want to say the South or like West, well, I think it was on the West side of the city, but um, but he, he somehow, my buddy got us like a meeting with him, like not for, not with any goal in mind, but just, just to like show him, you know, some, the stuff we were working on and get some feedback. And this is, this would have been when I was like 19 and like my first batch of beats, I was like horrified, you know, I burned a CD, like wrote Patty Fatstacks on it or something. And, uh, 
yeah, I had a couple other friends with me who, sh- who played their stuff, and there was, was a little more like of like kind of a weird flex. Like one of my friends had a song called like I'm a Boss or something. We're like skinny little white kids. And he, he was like, he's like, maybe, he's like, man, that's cool. It's like, maybe just, you know, maybe just be yourself, you know, <laughs> like on the songs. And then, so we're all getting our like super nice, but like definitely like kind of panned, you know, feedback. And then I played this one beat that I called PD Rock. And I played bass on it and I did some scratches on it. And, uh, and he starts bobbing his head. And then, it, you know, he looks at me kind of funny and he like starts bobbing his head again. And he looks back at me, he's like, you made this? I'm like, yeah. He's like, man, I would bump this on my front porch. And I was like, oh, hell yeah. Like, I should just, I don't know. Like, that's a dude. You know, he has no reason to to blow smoke. So that was like the first, you know, kind of um, like blessing from someone that, that mattered. That wasn't just one of my friends, you know. That's like an elusive thing about i mean creativity in general but definitely like music making right it's like i'll bang my head against the wall we'll have like you know 20 mixes of of a song and you're you're trying to like really like control a recording and like force these kind of details and things to happen and then yeah like the magic will come from from something very mindless and effortless like the moment you're not you know the moment you're not um putting too much conscious effort into it you'll actually get you actually get something special out of it. That's like fan, fanfare with with Magic City Hippies. So that's like, I mean, to this day, you know, we've released a bunch of music since, but I think that's like the more, that's the song that people wait for, you know, on, on tour. And that's, it's got, you know, a bunch of streams. And um, that rap verse in that, the door opening is, it's literally like Robbie wrote, we had, I had this instrumental. That instrumental was actually supposed to be, the first version of that instrumental, I had this idea for this other, artist who was also like managed by our same manager who was a rapper named ghost ghost rider out of out of uh, miami he still just put out a project recently he's awesome check it out um but i wanted to do like the side by side record of like a bunch of like make a bunch of retro instrumentals that stand alone and then sample them to make like the beats for his thing it was a little ambitious for like what i was maybe capable of as a producer at the time so that didn't pan out but i had this instrumental sitting around and then we we worked on it a little bit and Robbie wrote a verse to it, but he was like, kind of like, not like, sh- he's not shy, but like he was, he was like, he was basically like, this is, this is silly. Like, I'm probably not going to, this probably isn't going to be it, but like, I wrote this, like, can I lay it down? And because he was like, outwardly like this is probably isn't it you know we didn't like we weren't all quiet and everything you know in the room so like the door opening at the beginning of that song and then like us laughing at the last like line of it him almost kind of laughing at it you know it was all just us like not caring about the recording at all and and just and being like okay yeah this is a scratch tape this is clearly a scratch tape but you know we we did it a bunch of times afterwards we're like yeah okay that was a scratch that's got all like our voices in it and all this stuff and it just didn't have like that vibe and fun and that thing. I grew up on the east side, the mug and be beat side, deep fry, and greet line, clam baked by the seaside. Ten legs with her knee highs. Sand shakes off their sweet thighs. Back in under now when I was super spoon fair. Pops at the poster, doling out the bread. John's on the saucer, going against his head. I got divorced, yeah, cold as a coast, but the And yeah, it's just something like, like that's, I feel like that's what people, obviously there's, you know, I did my best with the instrumental and the groove and the mix and all this stuff after the fact. But I think a lot of people hear, you can just hear the, you can hear the vibe in that, just the fun, the the lightheartedness um, about it. And, you know, it's just something that was like, that's not intended to be, that we were not like in studio, you know, in conscious studio focus mode, everybody quiet you know two inches from the mic like it was just it was all so loose and and it worked out to being like one of the things that people like to listen to most you know and that's like can happen that way it's let like, me ask you so if if the red hot chili peppers are releasing an album this year after a decade-long absence john for is is rejoining them do you think that they're going to be able to create magic like that or do you think they're going to be like that hyper focused and it's going to end up not being a good album because you know, maybe that magic isn't there. What do you What do you think? 
Because you you saw them at Lollapalooza, right? I have seen the Chili Peppers five times. That's my favorite band. So are you are you hyped for the for him to come back into the band, or are you do you have a little bit of reservation? I screamed out loud. People thought something happened when I looked at my phone that day. I had just gone to there's a, there this was before the pandemic, I think, just before it, um, or maybe during. I don't know. I can't remember, but somehow there was Smorgasburg was still happening, which is like this like food truck festival in the fashion district in LA that I used to go to to get this awesome pastrami. Anyway, <laughs> I remember, I remember exactly where I was when I heard the news that John Frusciante was back, was back in the Chili Peppers. Is my point that combo? You know, obviously Hillel Slovak was was the original you know guitarist, and and uh, John Frusciante takes a lot after his sound, also after Hendrix and a lot of. A lot of guitarists who influenced him, but that, and you know, in my opinion, and the music of theirs that means a lot to me, that a lineup, uh, you know, Frusciante, Chad Smith, Lee, and, and Anthony Kiedis, that they've already talked about how really they're just they're just trying to love the process right now of making music. I I I can't imagine what it's like to be making music. What like you know, releasing records once you're already in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and you know, like I I, I don't know where you find you know, the hunger or, or if there's anybody, you know, saying that you still have anything to prove or anything like that, you know, I, I just, I wonder what that's like. That must be challenging. Um, or maybe not, maybe it's just nice. Um, I don't know what it's like to make music with millions of dollars and world fame, you know, behind you, but I think they're just, I don't think it's probably changed their process much from how they always do it. I don't know if I've ever heard them like chasing, even with the last, like the last couple records I didn't love, but you know, I just, I never heard, heard them like phoning it in, like trying to make a, a hit or update themselves for like the kids or something like that. You know, I, I don't ever really get that, but I think, I feel like they always kind of just do what they want. I think there is maybe something about the like youth and ego and chaos, you know, of, like when maybe, maybe back when, when they were a little more dysfunctional, you know, some, some crazy or ideas like happened or it felt more like capturing lightning in a bottle. Um, but I'm looking forward to it either way. Uh, you know, the, the single, the single was, was all right. I was just happy to hear, I was just happy to hear those four, you know, playing together again. So when you first started out, steady you know these these weekly three set gigs for years at the barracuda bar you weren't even getting paid you probably didn't even envision this as a career what was the defining moment where you guys kind of looked at each other and said hey let's have more than just fun let's make this our full-time jobs was it increased demand or was it something bigger than that making a record together um for one robbie having you know original songs and also the ability to collaborate with us on making new original songs from scratch. But he also already had like Robbie just has that about him where he, he needs to do that. He needs to write songs. It just, it just happens. It's like one of the things he does as opposed to, I don't, you know, I don't know. I think early on he realized he liked doing it and was good at it and, and, you know, considered like put effort into like making it happen. But, um, you know, he's just somebody that, that there's just people I get to know who's it's just kind of a part of just how some people journal or paint or whatever. Like he's he writes songs, like they'll just kind of fall out of them into these voice memos. And that was something even from playing granted, like, you know, I got to know that gradually over the course of like playing, you know, these these like three, four hour, yeah, for for just uh bottomless, you know, beer pitchers basically. Like we didn't we had a tip jar and and we just got beer and that was like the only way I could go out um go out on the weekend and you know play shows and like so there were chops and everything like that like we would we would be able to jam and, and we would play some of his things i knew because I, I didn't recognize them as covers you know i knew they were originals of his he was, he was like super easy going about it oh like when I, I mentioned that i just wanted to start to try to like work on some of his songs like stuff that he hadn't recorded yet um and he had heard like beats i had made and i, I don't think anything was particularly impressive you know yet at that point it sort of been like 2011 over the course of a couple years, like we played that that gig for a while, and then Robbie um, disappeared to Argentina. He chased this woman he fell in love with down to moved down to Buenos Aires with her, and I thought I'd never see him again. And then uh, he showed back up. I guess you know that ended, and he showed back up with a broken heart and a ton more songs. And that was like the summer I moved into. The, what we called the hippie castle is like in a college house. And then John, who's, you know, our guitarist, like the, the third member of Magic City Hippies, um, 
I moved in with him and we started playing those, those gigs together. And that's when we started, um, that's when I started really, like that's when the Robbie Hunter band stuff like that was that album called Magic City Hippies came out in 2013, right? So up to that point, we were playing all the same sorts of gigs, just whatever gigs we could get. We're playing a bunch of Sublime covers and old school hip hop covers, a lot of reggae, a lot of, you know, we're playing like The General by Dispatch and whatever. And, um, you know, that would have just, I think that would have just plateaued and stagnated if not for, yeah, like original music and an ability to self-produce and present it you know, where it could play side by side with a lot of the stuff that was inspiring us. We were really into Vampire Weekend, um, you know, I don't know, like the Gorillas, Beck, like all, all sorts of stuff, like later on Tame Impala and just any anything. I, I mean, I think Channel Orange came out that year and that was like just a huge influence on like putting together a record with like interludes and like skits, and like voicemails and, you know, just kind of building like a collage aspect to a to an album and so like that album in 2013 was the thing where like I think we leveled up creatively to like make an album and create a visual aesthetic and make music videos together and and we put some stuff out on online and and got you know it was back when hype machine was a big deal or you know like the blogs like indie shuffle and all that stuff and we got you know attention on on those things and on those platforms and it was like oh shit like this has never ha- you know, happened before. And it was looking left and right and like other bands I'd been in before that. And, you know, we had never kind of gotten that, that chance where it kind of rose up out of the local scene. Like it was, it was like being listened to so much more, you know, elsewhere than directly around us by people we knew or came to our shows in Miami even, you know? And then there was, yeah, we don't know how to play these songs live. You know, like we just used the studio as an instrument and did whatever we wanted to kind of play around and have fun and like have whatever's hopping out of the speakers, you know, feel great. And they were like, how do we need like, we need more people. Like, how are we going to like, how are we going to do this? Like we, there was like a whole, I want to say there was like a whole year where we we're just like that album's out and it's on all these blogs and it made a couple like best of lists for a few blogs. And we're like, we don't we, like, we can't tour that. We don't know how we'd like, we're like, we kind of got, you know, ahead of ourselves um, a little bit, but yeah, that was, I think we, you know, chased that. We put a lot of heart and soul into that record and it turned out. It turned out pretty good. We were really proud of it. And then we had to kind of, that was like the beginning of like trial by fire, just like figuring out the rest of it, all the other aspects of it. And then, you know, people who heard it, you know, came, showed up wanting to help or get involved or, you know, whether it was videographers or a manager or. And that's when Hard On Me kind of took off too, yeah, right? that was the one. Yeah. Hard On Me and Corazon. Yeah. Hard On, Hard on Me video was directed by uh Jordan, who's a realtor in Miami now. Yeah, Crazy. yeah, it's true. He's a realtor in Miami. He was, yeah, talented. Crazy how life director. works. It is. It is. People where people end up, you know. Along with, they're all part of this, part of our story, and and some are still, you know, doing music, and others, yeah, realtors in Miami. That's yeah, it's pretty. That's <laughs> funny. <laughs> the majority of the Water Your Garden record was written at your your homes after the uh, the Modern Animal Tour wrapped in March. You said something interesting once where when you produce a record, you have to be kind to yourself. And other members of the band said submitting demos to you can be exhausting. Obviously not in the sense that you're exhausting, just the process. So as you make more and more records, as you're in the band for another year longer, are you easier on yourself? Does it get easier? It's definitely a mission statement for this year and this next batch of music you know that whatever it's going to be that i make with the band and with with maya and with these uh, these other artists who i'm I'm wanting to keep up with opportunities to work with i'm i'm going to be walking that that uh towing that line of of like healthy self-scrutiny and and just and yeah and being kind to yourself i think maybe the the kind yourself thing is a little more in action it's more like don't force it or don't like don't drink a bunch of like guayaki energy drinks and like not go home <laughs> you know, tonight like let's you know like go home you know take my melatonin and get like a proper amount of sleep like go like go for a run eat breakfast you know like do, do these things where it's like it doesn't have to i don't have to be like picture of dorian gray like suffering at the expense of the art like aging <laughs> because i'm not taking care of myself because like i'm haunted by my by my snare sound or or something like that i, f- I feel like i've taken i've taken it very seriously in the past and it doesn't always work to the benefit of the of the art itself so i think that's something i'm just trying to trying to keep in mind you know balance my life out um a little bit i think it's a pandemic thing that kind of hit everybody too like anyone who was a workaholic who had kind of that 
that void of time. And, and that was, you know, that was, we were on tour. We had played the most like leading up to the pandemic where, where that was the beginning of the process of making all the songs for that album for water your garden. You know, it was the modern animal tour, which is a long, it was like a two month tour before that at the end of 2019, we were on another like month and a half long tour. Um, before that we played like, I want to say like 14 festivals or something that like, it was just balls to the wall for like for a couple of years and like we had the craziest live show run like year of our lives and then and then that tour and then all of a sudden like an unprecedented amount of just like blank you know calendar and that's like why the album i was kind of turned into why we did. john wrote a song called water your garden for his for his um fiance and uh but it turned into like that phrase and ended up meeting a lot more stuff because we were like, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm finally going to move out to LA, you know, because my uh, girlfriend at the time, you know, had been out there for, for two years and we had been long distance. And I was like, I wanted to make the move for myself, you know, to, to Los Angeles as a producer and, and to kind of be kind of in the fold. Um, Robbie's partners in Bozeman, Montana, um, you know, John was, was, had his roots kind of laid down in Miami still. And we were like, okay, well, we can all, you know, be where we need to be with the people we need to be with and kind of try to nurture our lives and and try to start this process of making an album, you know, remotely. Whereas before that, we would o- always be, you know, like four nights a week from working day jobs and then like 10 from 10 p.m. to like 3 a.m. or whatever, or four nights a week, you know, drinking and smoking and and chipping away at you know at a at a song or a project or whatever or rehearsing or whatever and we just we had kept that up for years um this like nocturnal you know hustle at it and this is the first time that it wasn't like that where we weren't all in the same city um like committed to that that routine um and felt a little healthier felt a little more balanced felt like we were all able to you know like our lives were a little more balanced out but, but kind of myself yeah water your garden you know water your garden make sure you can, you can water your garden and then you can water other people's gardens and i feel like you know we i don't know if i took that advice throughout the course of the entire you know year and a half two years that that album got made but um it's definitely something you know carrying into the future of of just life and making music just try to try to try to chill out not take it too seriously and not to be too hard on myself, but at the same time, like definitely, yeah, like reference Kevin Parker's, you know, mixes and productions and like cry a little bit. So is, um, is you know, I, yeah. without being too dramatic, is that kind of the reason why you, why you didn't join all the tour dates? Cause I remember that announcement was made, but there wasn't really a reason why. Yeah. We were just so balls to the wall for years before that there wasn't even like time to like take a breath, you know, and, and look around. And I think it just, it takes a certain, it, it, I'm definitely like, I've been able to thrive on tour. There's things about it that are great. You know, like you do have a purpose every day. You have this objective and you're kind of like in like a little army platoon, you know, with your tour manager and your merch guy and your bandmates. And you got to get from point A to point B and you got to, you know, get everything work. You got to solve a bunch of problems. You're kind of a freight trucker. Also, you got to like, you're going to blow out a tire on your trailer. You got to change it. You got to make it there on time. You got to put on this badass rock show. It it is like invigorating. It's like the adventure of a lifetime, you know, to to get to just get to do that. And so I'm I'm grateful for it. But it's also something where um, I'm not particularly good at at tending to like the the planet that's spinning without me. You know, while I'm, you have to you very have, much have to focus on your day to day on tour. And I would have, you know, my my relationship and other things going on. And I would have other music, you know, that I was working on with other artists, I'm very involved with and. And that mean a lot to me. And um, it was just, I realized it's, it's like impossible. Like I, um, I also wore, you know, wore a lot of hats on tour and we all do. Um, but, you know, it wasn't necessarily like, you know, we're not out there with, with roadies and, and like a whole crew. It's not like I, you know, walk on stage and pick up my drumsticks and just do the show. It's like, we're, you know, we're driving that, we're all splitting the what the seven hours or whatever we have to get there. We're, we're the ones out there changing the tire. If something happens, we're, you know, we're on the phone with our manager about like the the budget, like how are we doing? Are we in the red? 
you know, whatever. We're setting up the our lights and our you know, loading in our stuff and, and playing the show and then loading it out at the end of the night. Um, you know, it's a rigorous, it's a rigorous thing. And then I was, I was still, I was like working on this album while we were on, um, you know, tour. I was like working on the modern album or modern animal album while we were on like the tour at the end of 2019 still. And, um, or I guess it would have been the one before that, but it's, it's just something where I had to be honest with like myself where, you know, I, I'm not, I wasn't able to balance my life and still, and still do that. And I also, you know, I have, I think my, you know, I'm accepting, I'm kind of accepting what like my wheelhouse is, what I think my superpower is. And I think it's more in the studio and it's more with, with production and building these worlds. And I want, I want to be able to kind of settle in and plant my feet out here in LA and, and do that and continue to do that with the band, you know, with my bandmates. What, what if Stones Throw approached you and said, "Hey, look, we have Madlib, we have the Twilight Tone, we have Kiefer, we want another producer on the label, and you can still be in Magic City Hippies, but now your name is Fat Stacks, and you're releasing music next to Benny Sings." Like, think the intro track "Garden Fire." It started as a production experiment instrumental, but like a whole album of that. Would you be opposed to that? Would that be? Would that add another spinning plate? to your schedule or would that be better for your mental health? <laughs> would I be opposed to that? Yeah, I would be, a, <laughs> be opposed. No, that's the, that's the dream come true. Oh God, I love that label. I love Benny Sings. I love Keep Everyone you just mentioned. Because um, I think you fit in there. I'm not, like, you wouldn't be an anomaly on that roster. Oh, I don't oh, think well, so. That's, I think, oh, well, I thank you so much for saying that. That's very, that's very flattering. And, and I, I, I would like to agree. I would like to agree with that. Um, that is, that is a dream of mine you know that's something it, it is a dream of mine to have to have a um how would i say it not even uh i got like project or just or just like as an entity to be able to be able to do um to be able to do something like that to fit in over at at stones throw i love how collaborative they are over there you know and then with like even like in inside and outside of the label, you know, it's like obviously like the no worries thing with Anderson Pack, but then like you got Benny Sings on the Free Nationals record, and um, I don't know, it's just it's so great. I just love, I love that, I love that label so much. Um, yeah, I just I want to message Peanut Butter Wolf and be like, hey, did you know that Barack Obama sits in his easy chair and he listens to music produced by Pat Howard? Come on, man, sign him up. <laughs> sign me up yeah wow what a trip right? sign them up that's crazy um yeah i it's like it's like i don't know i was like rambling about something like this like when we first started talking it just it's, it's all it's all music and it's all just a matter of like feeling something and sensibility and all the different types of music that we like and we let into our lives so you mentioned yeah like the Barack obama thing is, is too right that's like that bolero um that me and, and fernie and and Maya made uh with her with her dad also with fernando osorio but um and yeah, the range from that to like to Garden Fire to you know some of the older stuff we've done. It's like I, I do, I do feel like I would, I would just yeah. The answer is like I would. That's that is kind of part of what I want to like let into the possibilities of my of my future. And, and it's hard to like it's hard to you know head towards something like that when you when you have to be like kind of plucked away for months at a time on tour and there's a lot of preparation and, and in that it just has a little less return. It doesn't, it has a massive return in the, in the fact that you're performing music live and it's like the realest thing, you know, you can do and you, you get out of your head and you're not looking at Spotify stream numbers and everything like that. You're like in front of people who care. And that's like, that's really special. But, but also like, yeah, you know, I want to, I'm out here. I, I, I live like, I just moved to an apartment. And I'm like, I don't know, a mile from Gold Line Bar, you know, it's like the the one that Peter Butterwolf opens and opened and that all the like, you know, Stone Throw cats do like their DJ sets at and everything. And I'm just like, man, like, you know, I'm in the fold out here and I just I just yeah, I wanna like do my thing and like make music that I love and 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 you know, craft like musical friendships and just be on be on that adventure. I'll put I'll put in a good word for you, man. I'll I'll tell Wolf that the you know that that two track it wasn't in some fancy studio it was uh in the middle of the night at some airbnb in philadelphia and you're chugging energy drinks and boom you know that's all that's all you that need that's true that is true yeah and when i got my little i'm i'm here I'm talking to you from glendale right now i got my tascam 388 next to me. i got my hipster analog you know instruments and stuff i i 
I fit in right So it, you have that ear, you have that eye. You know, you're not just trying to be a hippie. You're not trying to be cool. I think real musicians, they gravitate towards that type of stuff. And even Jonathan, who's filling in for you on tour, he has this darker, drier cymbal setup. You know, it's more jazz focused. He added a, a cymbal clap stack with an old Ozone and a broken AAX. So, you know, if you go and you see them on tour, I don't know if the if the common fan in the crowd will pick up on maybe his drum set versus yours, but there is a slight adjustment. It was a little bit like, you know, an exercise in letting go because you have like, I just have this tattooed on my mind, the way I've played the set all these years and, and like the way, cause I program, you know, I played the drums on the records or program the drums on the records. And I'm just like, no, it's gotta be like this, you know? And just to, to let go and to enjoy it so much, um, just to have someone kind of splash their own paint on it, you know, um, is really cool. And I think it, 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 I think it rejuvenated the guys a little bit too, just to go out and not do it, you know, like rinse and repeat, like the way we've been doing certain songs, like everything's a little different, you know, everything's got a little bit of a different pocket and a little bit of more of his, yeah, his darker sound and his, his like chops, his lightning chops. <laughs> He's crazy. Um, Jonathan Hewlett is a bad, bad man on drums. So that was it's a very, very worthy replacement. Honestly, he plays it, he plays circles around me, to be honest. Let's just be honest. But um, but it was cool. Yeah, like there's a there there is a distinction there where I realized like, you know, when you get to see the same musical context and one that I've been a part of like building and and see another drummer plug into it, um, you get a a you know, a clarity about your own like kind of voice a little bit. And I was like, oh, okay. And so it, it, it wasn't like a, it's not like a comparison or standoffish thing. It was really like, oh, I see like, okay, I guess this is kind of my, my inclination is like, I'm like going more, I, I, I it took me like those musical arrangements took me live at least because you, you never quite get produced drum sounds live. you got to kind of just make it happen with a one size fits all vibe. Usually um, I go a little more Chad Smith john bonham with it like i hit a little harder and i got my snare you know cracking and like the parts are a little more spread out and it's just like big bombastic you know like confident fills and then it's like to see someone come at it with with a little more nuance and with yeah some more textures you know like the, cl the clap stack is dope i'm probably gonna steal that <laughs> um <laughs> but um yeah no very i mean very very astute observation there yeah because what, what i find funny is like the the john fushanti situation is like you can play in the chili peppers for 10 years you can come out with three albums and oh hey sorry guy john wants to come back out you go so if this drummer ends up being in the band on tour in the studio you can always say hey jonathan hit the road pat's back hey, you know he could fill in for you for two nights or 10 years but your spot's always warm yeah just like you know everyone everyone should like whether it's me you know john robbie like anyone who's playing the live band you know, right now it's Jake and uh, and Jonathan uh, and Guille, you know, and before that it was Fernie on keys. Every, every, just everyone should just feel, you know, free and no one no one should feel in prison. Obviously, there is commitment and compromise. And, you know, like me and John and Robbie, we were on this journey and like we this is our baby, you know, for for um, over over 10 years now, even though you know, the first album didn't come out till 2013, like we've been working towards something together. And uh, but so there is compromise and commitment. But you know, everyone should also feel free. It should feel voluntary and invigorating and it shouldn't feel at the expense of like, you know, your, your gut, you know, you're, like if you've got this gut feeling that you want to go for something, and um, you know, beyond, beyond this or parallel to this, um, you know, everyone, everyone should be encouraged, you know. And they have been, they've been super supportive, you know, of, of decision to do this it was scary because it's like well we we're all like is this gonna work like is you know our fans gonna care or, you know like there's just all these nightmares you can you can have about you know um 
bad, worst case scenarios. And it just, it just wasn't like that. It was just, I think the morale was so good and, um, you know, people were there for it. People loved, love what Jonathan brought to the table as a drummer is something so different and, and, um, you know, and beautiful. And, uh, yeah. And like, that's, that's kind of the idea is to, to, to make, to make room. Like, you know, I'll, I'll always be prioritizing this band in the, in the, in the hippies and I'm gonna, I'm gonna want to play, you know, shows and, and stuff, but it's just a matter of, yeah, planning my, planning my feet out here and, and seeing, seeing if, if stuff like that could fall together, if I could get, you know, involved with Stone's Throw with some artists out there or, or just with, just with anybody. I have so many, I have so many talented friends and I just, you know, I want to, I just want to pour, pour my heart into so much. And there just, there just needed to be a way, um, to, you know, just to redirect, to redirect some energy because I had to look at the thing that, you know, I wasn't personally able to handle my life around, which is touring. And it's also just a a very demanding and, and exhausting thing. I appreciate you. I appreciate you gassing me up with you know the possibilities um, you know that the maybe that the universe could have in store. You know I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to opening you know my my heart to all those to all those those possibilities for myself as a producer and and everything. I'm a huge fan. You're immensely talented, and I only wish for bigger and better things for you through 2022 to the point where you can spin your plates and none of them break on the floor. So. Thank you, Pat, for being here. Oh, thank you so much. No, it was really, yeah, really an honor to, to get on and chat. I really, really appreciate it.